situation where I wanted to find the difference in sample means, but I only had the sample variances from the troops. So this is more likely, right? This is the more likely scenario. Well, if I only have sample variances, when I'm building my confidence interval, it's gonna look exactly the same as before. It's just instead of that Z distribution, now I have to use the student T distribution. Right? And here, where I before was multiplying by the standard deviation for the difference in my sample means, well, I'm still gonna be doing that. It's just that now, instead of using population variances, I'm only using sample variances, okay? So, you know, once we plug our values in, it's going to look no different than what it did before when we were doing the difference in sample means. It's just really the main difference is we're going to be using that student T distribution. Okay. So the equation for that student T distribution, I know I've got this an old file, so I'll show this to you because I think it's, uh, oh, no, that's not it. See, I probably got it back here somewhere. I'm gonna guess it's about week, we're like what, week 13? Nope, week 12. So I'll show this to you. So what is our degrees of freedom gonna be? And kind of the, right? So how many degrees of freedom, all of them? So this is be the equation. Instead of N minus one, you would have to use this equation. This is nasty, all right? It's basically just kind of taking some relative <clears throat> uh, ratio in a way of the two sample variances and sample sizes. I'm not gonna make you do this, right? This is way too easy to make a mistake, okay? So on the exam or on these problems, I'll give you an assumed true degrees of freedom. In fact, I'll post an announcement. So I know I put up that, that um, next connect assignment. For the questions where you only have sample variances, you would have to calculate your degrees of freedom. I'll put up an announcement on Canvas that tells you for those problems what degrees of freedom you should use, right? I, I you know, it's a little bit, you know, just saves you a little bit of time, but also this is like just easy to make a, a very, you know, parentheses mistake in your calculator. So I'm not just trying to, to make sure you can, can use this one. This doesn't really tell us a whole lot, so I'm not really concerned with this formula, okay? So I'll always give you the assumed true degrees of freedom, okay? Now, when we calculate this, if it is something like 80.3, or 80.8 even, we always just round it down. I kind of call this flooring it. I'll show you why in Excel, um, the, the, the function's called floor. So that's kind of why we think about it. It's like pushing it down to the next integer. Even if it was like 88.9, you would just use the degrees of freedom of 88, okay? But I'll give you those assumed degrees of freedom for those connect problems. And then on the exam, as we start getting closer to that, when we work through the practice exams, you'll kind of see any problem where we only have sample variances for two population examples, I'll give you that assumed true degrees of freedom. Before I didn't because it was easy. It was just n minus one. Well, this is not easy, right? This is this is nasty. Okay, so um, let's take a look at how we do this in Excel. Okay, I think I have uh, here we go. So if we go to that this male and female data sheet, right? I think I had BMI measures. So let's do, take the average, right? Female BMI. I'm then gonna do my sample variance. I'm then gonna do my sample size using that count function. These are all things hopefully we're pretty familiar with, right? The average gives us the mean, var.s gives me the sample variance and count gives me the sample size. I'm gonna do that trick, not trick, but I'm gonna cross-reference my sheets so I'm gonna go back to that female data, select that sample mean, and notice because I like ordered it correct, if I copy this down, it keeps using that sheet, but it updates the cell reference so that it just keeps moving down this column. Right? So instead of going back and forth three times, I could just do it once and get all three of those values in there, okay? I then could do the same thing for males. So I go average male BMI, Ver.s gives me the sample variance for BMI for males, and then do my sample size, okay? So I did the cell assignment very similar to this, okay? So it's blank, but notice once I filled in the sample mean, sample variance, and sample size, 
I already had typed in there the degrees of freedom equation. So notice that's that equation I showed you on the screen, right? This is very easy to make a mistake if you were typing this in. So in that Excel assignment, that function is already in there. So I set it up, like I gave you a little more format in that assignment than I have in some of the other ones. So that I forget the two groups that we had there, but I set it up very similar to this. So if you put your sample mean, sample variance, and sample sizes here, that degrees of freedom function already has the cell references and it'll calculate it for you right away. Okay, is that clear? Actually, oh, I don't wanna do this. Let's go. I'll show it to you just to, to make sure that that's clear. Um, so we had currently the connect and Excel assignment out there. Kind of do that Wednesday after Thanksgiving break. Um, we should have after Monday covered everything you, you should need to kind of get, get through those. Um, let's take a look at that fourth Excel assignment though. So if I download the data, because I actually can't remember what example I gave you. Okay, so yeah, this enrollment too, that was the one where you had sample means and sample variance. I, I set it up very similar, right? So here we were comparing male and female undergraduates at these different, um, different universities. So once you plug everything in here, notice that functions already got all those cell references already built in. So as soon as you start updating, you know, finding that sample mean, sample variance, and sample size, that degrees of freedom calculation will, will automatically occur for you, okay? Just like it did here. So we have a huge sample size. We have huge sample sizes here. So we get this really high degrees of freedom. Right? From here, we could start to do things like calculate these confidence intervals in Excel. All right. So, oh shoot, it wasn't recording that. So <laughs> uh, what I just went through, I didn't realize I wasn't sharing the screen for the video. If anyone's kind of watching this after the fact, right? We were just taking a look at this fourth Excel, and I already had that equation kind of built in. So you just had to, to plug in those sample mean, sample sizes, and sample variances. Okay. So if we then wanted to do something like build confidence intervals, right? We know this is the equation that we're going to want to use, right? But we just need to use Excel to be a calculator and to find these T values for us. Okay. So instead of norm.s.inv, we're just going to use the t dot inv, right? Because we now have to use a student t distribution because we only have sample variances here. Okay? So I still tell it I want alpha over two, right? It's a confidence interval. So I've got an area on each side of my confidence interval. So alpha over two is on each side. The positive and negative are already built in, right? I'm subtracting that number of standard deviations to get my lower bound. I'm adding that number of standard deviations to get my upper bound. So I'm just going to take the absolute value of that so that I you know, just have the number, right? I don't want it to be negative. Oops. So I have too few arguments. So what I forgot was, oh yeah, if I'm using the student T distribution, I need to tell it what my degrees of freedom is. So after I tell it alpha over two, I'll put a comma, and then I have to tell it what my degrees of freedom are, I guess. And that's up here in this cell, okay? So now when I hit enter, it should be okay, except for if I want to copy this down, what's going to be the problem? So I want my alphas to update for the different levels of confidence, but what don't I want to change? I wanna keep using that same degrees of freedom. So where that cell reference is, I'm gonna freeze that, okay? Now, when I copy this down, I'll get my three T values pretty quickly. Now, one thing to kind of notice here, um, just for some comparison, if I did the normal distribution here and I did alpha over two, what I'll end up seeing is if I have a degrees of freedom of 6,000, one thing that I told you with one population and it applies to two populations, as my degrees of freedom gets higher, remember as I'm getting closer to that last row on the student T table, my T values start to get closer and closer to the values I would find from my standard normal distribution. So with a degrees of freedom of 6,000, notice these are like barely different, right? I mean, they are a little different, right? Cause it's still not, you know, a standard normal. It's just got a high degrees of freedom but these values start approaching my standard normal distribution values, okay? So I just wanna kind of point that out there related to some things that we've talked about, okay? 
So one mistake that I, I was seeing kind of a lot in those last Excel assignments with confidence intervals is make sure you're not putting alpha in here, right? I saw some people try to put alpha in for the T value. You actually need to use whatever that T value is. So from here, right, I could break this down to steps or I could do it all at once. So I'll break it down to steps because I think that's easier. I'm going to calculate this standard deviation in a separate cell, okay? So I'm going to put that right here, okay? So the standard deviation of my sample difference, and this is just using Excel to be my calculator, right? So I'm going to take the square root of each group's sample variance divided by that group's sample size, right? So this is exactly what I did for the examples that we went over on Monday. It's just instead of known population variances that are given to you, you have these sample variances that you could calculate from the data, right? This is the more likely scenario, right? We just very rarely are given the, the population variances. So I'll hit enter here. Now it's just a matter of using Excel to be my calculator to find my upper and lower bounds. So I'll center my confidence interval around whatever that sample difference is. Oops, I forgot my equal sign. So I'll take male B, uh, mean BMI minus female mean BMI. I'll subtract kind of the number of standard deviations the way I want to go, multiplied by what that standard deviation actually is. Right. Now, when I copy this down to do my other lower bounds, I don't want anything to change except for the number of standard deviations away that I'm going to get that lower bound. So this T value is the only cell reference I don't want to change. So command T or F4 on a computer, command T on a Mac. I'll freeze all those other cell references. Now, when I copy this down, I've got my three lower bounds. To get my upper bound, I'm just gonna copy, hit enter to get out of the cell, paste. Instead of subtracting that margin of error, I now add that margin of error, right? Remember kind of our margin of error here is reflected in whatever we're adding and subtracting to our sample difference that we found, or that difference in sample means that we found, okay? So now when I hit enter, I copy this down, and I've got three confidence intervals, okay? Any questions on, on this before we keep moving? I wanna see a cell again, or what has something changed? Okay with this. So one thing to kind of point out here is at the 99% level, what could I say about female versus male BMI here? BMI is like some measure of, I don't know, they, use, they try to use it to like tell people if they're underweight, overweight, but it's uh, not a perfect measure by any mean, means. And so maybe we were like concerned with, well, maybe there's, you know, some gender bias to this measurement. Right. And so maybe we want to test for whether or not across like these large samples, are we seeing differences in the BMI for males and females? Well, at the 99% level here, what could I actually say? Absolutely nothing. Right. And that's because I have what negative 0.7 to negative 0.03. So I'm thinking about here. Once I've built this confidence interval, it could be that that true difference, so I think I did uh, male minus female BMI. It could be that that true difference is negative, which would imply that female BMI is a little bit higher, right? It could be a positive value, which would imply male BMI would have to be higher. Or it could be that that true difference is actually zero and that there's no difference between male and female BMI, okay. or at least on average. So the 99% level, I really can't say anything. However, at the 99 and, sorry, 95 and 90% level, it looks like these are only negative values, which would imply if I set this up taking male minus female, if I'm seeing only negative values, that would imply that female BMI on average might be a little bit higher, right? So maybe there's something about this metric that kind of skews you know, towards one gender. So maybe I want to rework it, right? <laughs> um, maybe isn't it that valuable. And I can't even say that there's a difference at the 99% level. So, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, we can you think about, am I okay with 95% confidence here? 
or do I really want to be able to, uh, you know, say there's a difference of 99%. So you kind of notice, even if we find a really small difference here, right? Like the difference I found, the sample difference is what? 0.3 something or yeah, point. Yeah, really small. Okay. So even if I find a really small difference, right? If I get a really high sample size, what's that going to do to my margin of error? Well, it pushes my sample. If I push my sample sizes up, this will get smaller, right? The standard deviation on that difference gets smaller. If this is getting smaller, the amount I'm adding and subtracting to that sample difference is getting smaller. So I'm getting these really narrow confidence intervals, right? But I'm still doing it with a high level of confidence. I haven't changed the level of confidence I want to say at all. So jacking up these sample sizes, getting really, really big samples, I can start to get these pretty small confidence intervals, right? I mean, if I think about this here, you know, my confidence interval widths are only about what? Point, point 0.5 here. Like I'm getting a pretty, pretty tight confidence interval window. And I'm really able to like accurately pinpoint down where that true difference is. Okay. And that makes sense. If I have a larger sample, it should be more reflective of the population. And so my sample means that sample difference is going to be more informative about what that true difference actually is. Okay.